But this morning, I want to conclude the whole series on Advent. So if you turn me in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. In Isaiah chapter 9, it speaks to us about the Advent. It doesn't just give us the first Advent, but it gives us the first and the second Advent wrapped up in one. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 through 7, it shows us of this coming prince. I'm not going to focus on the first uh, five verses, but I'm going to just read verse 6 and verse 7. So if you're with me in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, say amen. amen. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And this is what we have to look forward to, the idea of when Christ returns, we will have a governmental system that is not Republican. It will not be democratic. It will not be communist. Not any sort of government that presently exists, this government will be. But this government be a righteous government and a government of peace which will have no end. And this is what we have to look forward to. Father God, as we go throughout this time, I ask that you would open our eyes, give us eyes to see. I ask that you would open our ears, O oh God, that, get, that you would give us ears to hear. Help us to discern the truth of your word and to walk accordingly. We thank you for your word of truth and pray that you've, you would make it more sure in our lives and guide us that we become doers to your glory. We ask this in the mighty name of Yeshua, our King, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm coming into uh, next week. I uh, want to encourage you. Um, to uh, purchase a little notebook. You can purchase a notebook from anywhere, Walmart or any of those stores. Purchase a notebook. Um, I suggest that you have one where you can keep a little pen on it and you can uh, keep the pages marked and so on and so forth. But I'm encouraging all of you to buy a notebook and this notebook is for Sunday mornings. This notebook is for Sunday mornings. I'm encouraging you to come to church with a notebook for Sunday mornings because I want you to write what God is speaking to you and your thoughts as um, preaching uh, scriptures that you either don't understand or it's confusing, write it so you can go back and look at it, take down notes from what is being said. But when the scripture says to study to show yourself approved, I do not believe that Messiah had planned for folks to come and gather together on a Sunday morning to sit down and do no intake. Um, Paul told Timothy to bring the books and the parchment, especially the writings. So, so Paul himself was writing down as he was going through. I suggest that you write down as you go through. Let this year be a year where you study the word of God to show yourself approved in a different way. So when you come to church on a Sunday morning, I should be expecting everyone's books to be open like they're in a classroom. Um, I have a joke that I won't share, but... I was talking to, a, uh, well, I wasn't talking to a guy. I was at a dinner table in Washington. I was at a dinner table in Washington, and uh, a pastor, it was a bunch of pastors, and one of the pastors was asking me if I know of a church somewhere up there in North Dallas uh, that they call the seminary church. I'm like, the seminary church? He's like, yeah, the pastor always uh, preaches with PowerPoints and um, encourages people to take notes and it's like they're in a seminary classroom. I'm like, um, no, I've never heard of it. He's like, yeah, uh, it's, it's, he says, it's called North Dallas Bible Fellowship. <laughs> North Dallas Muni Bible Fellowship. I'm like, oh, I think I heard of that church. And he was talking to me about the seminary church, and 
how they do things and so on and so forth. And then he asked me, so where do you go to church? Well, it was a fun conversation. <laughs> but the reason why I truly want you to, to bring notebooks is truly for you to take notes. I want you to take notes specifically when I say something that concerns you. If it bothers you, if you, don't, if you didn't hear it before, go back and study that thing. You should not just be sitting and allowing me to say things and you're not checking it. Don't do that. That is not good. It's not good for you. It's not good for me. You need to do that. And so I'm encouraging you to do that, to get a notebook and to uh, be taking notes on Sunday mornings. All right. So as we conclude this Advent uh, series, as I was looking at this, the Advent is really a chronicle, and I'm actually going to write a... a a book series, right? The Chronicle of the Eternal Prince. Because the Chronicle is actually a saga. There are three parts to it, and the Chronicle of the Eternal Prince is one part of it. In this Chronicle of the Eternal Prince, um, we see the first coming and the rejection. So the Chronicle of the Eternal Prince actually has three parts, one that's in eternity, one that's before the arrival of the prince, and one that's the arrival of the prince and the second coming of the prince, which we are talking about now. That's the first coming and the rejection. I know, you're like, what? It's a story. It's a story of humanity. Because part two, um, after the first coming and the rejection, then there was the absent yet present. You'd be like, what's the absent yet present? Well, he's absent, but he's present in us. And so there is a story of that. It's called the church. And then there is the second coming announced. Uh, we call that the time of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation, when um, these catastrophic events will take place to show signs of the return of Messiah, when he will start to work with the Jewish people once more to fulfill all that he said to Abraham and David. And then we have the second coming, or what we call the end of time, when Messiah will actually come and set up his kingdom forever. But as we go through, the first advent we saw, otherwise known as Christmas, was just a part of the chronicle. Christmas is a part of a story. When we look at the narrative of the baby being born, the reason why I focus so much on advent is because the scripture folk gives a different focus than we would. If we just place the story and end it with magi, that's the wise man coming, or end it with shepherds heralding, that's the shepherds, right? Or end it with angels giving pronouncing, or, or pronouncing the arrival of, or we just end it with Herod killing babies, or we end it with gifts and trees, we miss the whole point of Advent. Advent isn't a new thing. Advent was to be expected. As a matter of fact, everyone who believed in God was expecting the coming of this prince, this eternal prince. And Advent was to demonstrate that this prince would actually come. It is his first arrival. As a matter of fact, when we look at the Old Testament, as we saw in the book of Isaiah, it gives us both the first and the second Advent at the same time. Now, the first advent or the coming of the promised child, that is the giving of the only begotten Son of God, was announced from Genesis 3.15, as we saw weeks before. This announcement of the coming son that would be the seed of the woman, remember Genesis chapter 3.15, it says that the serpent will strike at the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman shall crush his head. It was speaking of the advent of God where Christ would literally come, God would literally manifest himself in flesh to die for the sin of humanity. So the first advent was all about the descendant of Abraham, the descendant of David. Why the descendant of Abraham? Well, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7, it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. So notice, when we look at this passage here, 
What we see in verse 6 is the first coming of Messiah. That's the child who will be born. That's the son that will be given. Now, the rest of the passage speaks of the second advent, but it's speaking as if though it, all, it, it is all happening at one time. This is why we need to be students of the word, because when the prophets were prophesying, they themselves did not have the connection or all the pieces that we do today. They didn't have the scriptures to look at in its totality as we do. They didn't have the New Testament that brings light on the Old Testament. And so when Isaiah was prophesying, Isaiah was seeing exactly what the Lord called him to do. Now here's the thing. When we look at the prophet Isaiah, you need to know that prophets were not liked by the people. I know you read the prophets today and you look at the prophet and you be like, oh, well, you know, these are some great men and people are they saying they're prophets and so on and so forth and they're living in luxury. Prophets didn't live like that. There was no prophet who had a nice home and a house living comfortably. They were always rejected. They were always despised. As a matter of fact, the disciples were the same way, or better yet, the apostles were the same way. They were rejected by the community. Paul spent his whole life giving a defense of his ministry to the church. So we need to understand that when Isaiah is prophesying, he's not prophesying as this man who is up on this pedestal having everyone listen to him. His message was being rejected. The message of Messiah was being rejected from that time. Why would the message of Messiah be rejected? Because there were kings at that time. And there were kings over Judah and kings over Israel. But Isaiah said, but wait a minute, but there's going to, become, there's going to be one king and he's going to rule. What king wants to hear that and that's not him? You're telling me that another king is going to come and he's going to rule and he's going to be righteous? Uh-uh. I'm taking your head. Why? Because it sounds like you're threatening my throne. That's how the kings would have thought and that is how they thought. So when Isaiah is prophesying, no one, no king is feeling his message. So when we see these prophets on their prophesying note that they were prophesying in peril of their lives, with their lives being in danger at all times. So Isaiah is giving this prophecy, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given. Now, uh, Isaiah's prophets, or Isaiah the prophet, we call him the prophet, his ministry began sometime during the reign of Uzziah, in chapter 6 of Isaiah, we see in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. So we know that his reign um, started sometime during the reign of King Uzziah. Um, Isaiah ministered about 58 years from at least 739, that's in the year King Uzziah died, to about 681 when Sennacherib died. And so we know that his ministry was at least 58 years. Now, according to tradition dating from the 2nd century A.D., Isaiah was martyred by King Manasseh. Why was he killed? For his message. He was prophesying of a king that wasn't the king coming who was going to reign. The king didn't like that. And that's what prophets did. They announced, thus said the Lord. But the announcements of the prophets always had to do with the work of God in time. It all had to do with the chronicle of this coming Mashiach, Messiah, this one who will come, who will set up this eternal kingdom. So as Isaiah was prophesying, of course, King Manasseh didn't like it, so he had him killed. A Justin Martyr, he wrote that Isaiah was sword asunder with a sword. This is when, when Jesus in the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, he's speaking and he spoke of saying, this is what you did to the prophets who came before. You killed them. Jesus said, the prophets who came before, how you know that they were prophets? No one liked the message. Hear me. When the word of God is being spoken and men like the message, it's because they're not hearing it. If you've been going to church and you like the message, probably because you're not hearing it. Here's why. It's not that the word of God 
See, the word of God and the message of God is meant to build up, encourage, strengthen, and edify us. However, in order to do that, it must first crush our hearts. Why? Jeremiah 79. The heart is evil and deceitfully sick. And so our hearts must first be crushed, our hearts must first be broken, so that we can get to the place, as Paul said, of contriteness before God. Here's why. Our thought process, our heart, our thinking, our will, our intellect, our thought process is maligned. We, have, we were born into this thing called sin. And this is what Messiah came for. He did not come simply for us to focus on the arrival. But he came for us to focus on the purpose of the coming. The purpose of the coming was death. He must die that we might live. If he didn't die, we wouldn't live. Now, this, what we have now, I'm not calling this living. I'm calling this the walking dead. We are, at best, the walking dead. With, our, with Christ, we are now new creation. But without Christ, the walking dead will be permanently dead. What do I mean by that? I say this all the time. You came into the world complaining. For no reason. You came out, to, as soon as you came out, no one knows why we cry. It's a complaint. No one did nothing to you, but you came out whining. Why? That's sin. But here's the thing. You live long enough, you're going to go to the grave with everything aching and hurting. You're going to, you came out complaining, you're going to go complaining. Why? This life is sin. What Christ came to do was to eradicate sin. He came to destroy the sting of death, to remove death and to bring life. Not just a temporal life, but an eternal life. So when that baby that Isaiah prophesied about was to be born, it was to be one who would bring in eternal life. As a matter of fact, it says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. By the way, the us was in the world at that time that Isaiah was, spoken, was speaking to, but he was speaking to the nation of Israel. He was, he was saying, we have all these bad and evil kings. God is going to get rid of all the bad, evil kings. He's going to send his own king, and his king will set up this eternal kingdom. And that's where we will receive the blessing of Abraham. That's where we will receive the blessing of David. So in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, what the people of God was looking forward to was the fulfillment of the promises that God made to Abraham and what he made to David. So this idea of the coming Messiah was to fulfill promises that were made. So when we see this now, this child being born, the point of the child being born was a, just a minute detail to show that he would be born, to focus on what he was going to do. It's very important. His coming was to fulfill the promises to Abraham and to David about a flourishing kingdom. To Abraham, because God made a promise to Abraham about a people. So he must establish this people. To David, because he made a promise about a kingdom. So he must establish this kingdom. And so as we look through the Tanakh, the promises to Abram we see in the book of Genesis. Now, that flows down to David from the line of Abram. Remember, Abram had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had his 12 sons, one of his sons was Judah, David is from the line of Judah. Yeshua, Christ, is from the line of David, who's from the line of Judah, who's from the line of Abram. All that must happen so that we can now 
man, this is so interesting because the story, the narrative, how it works out, God could have just changed everything like that, right? But he didn't. He chose, he purposed to allow things to happen the way they're happening so that we would have the freedom to make a choice to choose him. People always ask questions like, well, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? I gave you the answer to that before. There are no good people. So why, do God, why does God allow bad things to happen to the innocent? I gave you the answer to that. There are none who's innocent. Well, why if God is a loving God, will he allow evil to persist? Okay. He will not allow evil to persist. Why evil is persisting now is because all men are evil. What? Yes, Adam gave dominion over Satan, so we all were now born in sin. And the sin is in our nature. No matter how good a sinful person is, they are still evil. No matter what good deeds a sinful person do, it is still evil. And we don't understand that because we use our sinful nature now to reason truth. We cannot get the truth from sin. The only way we can get the truth is by first our minds being converted or we being brought into the light, understanding the foolishness of the gospel. And when we get a comprehension of the gospel, then and only then can we actually see the world for what it is. This is why most Christians don't understand and will get frustrated and upset when I say certain things that goes against the culture because we're culturally minded. It's very hard for us who have grown up and so entrenched in sin to not understand how entrenched we are. We are so entrenched. Man, even as a believer, myself, I see things I do. When I sit back, I'm like, wow. Lord, help me. I don't care how good you think you are, you are messed up. The best of us is just a, a good mess. But the good thing is, God is in the habit of fixing messes. This is why he sent Messiah. Because none of us, none of us would even be, it, it, would, it wouldn't even be possible if we tried to work our way to God for us to even make a step towards him. This is why Messiah came, this promise of Abraham. Because God's promised people, read the Old Testament, you'll see they were messed up. But God kept running after them. They kept rejecting him. He kept running after them. They kept rejecting him. He, they, he kept running after them. Oh my goodness, he's still running after them. He's still running after them. And then he came to us. Peter says, you who are once not a people of God, you are now the people of God. Hallelujah, praise be to God. Because I know I'm not a descendant of Abraham. How do I know? Because I'm not one. But I am a descendant of Abraham. What? I was grafted in. I was adopted. See, adoption, I love it. Adoption is awesome. Why? Because it's one thing to give natural birth to a child than to not give natural birth and to grab that child and love that child as if though you give natural birth. See, adoption is so special because you willfully determined to choose someone who did not even feel as if though they were worthy to be chosen. And that's what God did for us. He adopted us. So the record of the, gene the, record of the genealogy of Jesus, Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abram that I was going through for the past weeks now, the whole idea and the reason why I stopped on that first verse is because truly, the reason why the gospel is taking place and the reason why Matthew put this at the top and explaining now the genealogy, of course, when you go through the Old Testament, you will see that they always start off with genealogies. The stories always start off with a genealogy showing why, who this person is. And notice, it always goes back to Abram and David. Why is that so important? It was because God made the promises to Abram and David. And so what we're seeing now in the first advent is the fulfillment of the coming of Messiah, but that is only a part or a small piece of the narrative that was given to us. Of course, um, in the month of March, um, I think is when we're going to celebrate resurrection this year. And 
when we celebrate resurrection, resurrection is just a part of the story. The birth and the death is a part of the story. Man, this story is long. That's why it's a chronicle and the chronicle of sagas. And so this whole idea now, um, Daniel explains this. Daniel explains this whole concept of the idea of Abram and David and Messiah. Now Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, something very interesting takes place where in Daniel chapter 1, King Nebuchadnezzar came and he besieged the city and he took them captive. Of course, this was prophesied by Jeremiah saying that Nebuchadnezzar would come and take them captive. Well, the king didn't listen. Nebuchadnezzar came. Nebuchadnezzar took the nation captive. Now Daniel goes of being in captivity now for 70 years. In Daniel chapter 9, 70 years has passed. And Daniel is now reading the book of Jeremiah in Daniel chapter 9 verse 1. And in reading the book of Jeremiah, Daniel recognized what God said would happen after 70 years because 70 years of captivity was promised. So Daniel comes, when he reads the book of Jeremiah, Daniel then prays to God and he says, Lord, we have sinned against you. Our fathers have sinned against you. We are not worthy of you. You are so good and benevolent. And so he gave God all these accolades. And then he says, but you promised that at the end of this time, you would free us from captivity. Daniel says, the time is up, Lord. So this is Daniel's prayer. Taking the word of God, going back to God, and showing God his own word that he promised. And God is going to fulfill his word. So when Daniel says this, God sends an answer back to Daniel through the angel Gabriel. Now, of course, we see this, the narrative when Gabriel sought to bring the answer to Daniel. He was held back by the prince of Persia. Now, Gabriel is an angel. Some would say he's an archangel, but I'm saying Gabriel is an angel. Gabriel, when he was coming, he was in the other realm, so to speak. Coming down, bringing a message to Daniel from the heavens. So as Gabriel is in this other realm, coming down into the realm of man to bring Daniel a message, he was accosted by a prince of another realm. But the prince had the name, the prince of Persia, better known as Iran. So the prince of Persia is an evil spirit. This evil spirit, this principality, this dominion came and he was stopping Gabriel from bringing this answer to Daniel. Why would a demon feel it necessary to stop an angel from bringing a message to a man? What, what was so important that not just some demons, legion, would come, but a specific dominion would come called the Prince of Persia. So the Prince of Persia came and he's now fighting Gabriel and Gabriel's trying to bring, bring the answer to Daniel and Gabriel couldn't overcome this Prince of Persia. Now Gabriel is, is an awesome dude, but he couldn't defeat this Prince. So Gabriel called for another Prince. Michael. Now, I don't know if you know who Michael is, but Michael appears to be like, like, Lou Ferringo, right? The green guy, Incredible Hulk, because when Michael comes, he just ripped things up. So Michael comes on the scene, and Michael just grabbed the Prince of Persia and said, man, look here. Oh, no, I, like, Prince of Persia goes. The Prince of Persia runs, flees, but he comes back with the kings of Persia. Wait a minute. As Paul says, rulers, dominions, principalities. And so we see the level of evil coming just to hinder the answer to a prayer. Now, the reason why this is important and why I'm going through this is because when Daniel gave the answer to the prayer, when Daniel received the answer to the prayer, 
Here's what it says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in an everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. What? Okay, he continues. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore the rebuilding of Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be 70, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks in which it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. So Daniel came and Daniel saw the full picture of what was going to happen. He saw Christ coming. He saw Christ dying. He saw Christ coming. I'm going to say it again. He saw Christ coming. He saw Christ dying. He saw Christ coming again. The nation of Israel didn't fully understand the vision of Daniel because if they did, they would have known that Christ was indeed Messiah when he came. The leaders who are the teachers of the Tanakh, the teachers of the law, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, they rejected Christ as being Messiah. One of them stopped at the beginning of Messiah's ministry and they realized that something was different about this man. And so he came to him at night. His name was Nicodemus in John chapter 3. So Nicodemus, it says, and there was a ruler of the Pharisees, sorry, a ruler of the Jews named Nicodemus. This man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the signs you do unless God is with him. So the ruler of the Jews, the Pharisees, they knew Jesus was from God. Even if they didn't accept him as Messiah, they knew the things that he was saying about himself was true. Nicodemus said it, he testified to it. But they still cut him off. They still took his life. Why? They had to. Even though the scripture clearly said it, and they could have gone right there in the book of Daniel and read it, just like Christians today, stubborn in heart. Now, when I say Christians, let me qualify, because I'm not speaking of those who are sealed by God and names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm speaking of people professing faith in Christ, but not living accordingly. You can say all you want, I'm a Christian. Christians aren't, Christian isn't a title. Christian is a description of what an individual does. An individual be is Christian. Right? I can say that, Jacob, bees? No, no, I, mean, I, I can't say bees? Okay. Uh, okay. I, I'm going to correct that then. An individual must be a Christian. To demonstrate that you are a Christian, the fruit of your life is the demonstration. By practicing and doing what Messiah said. Now, he never said to be perfect. He never said you wouldn't mess up. But what has happened is, the messed upness has become standard. And so we give all these excuses why we don't do the things we're supposed to do because, well, we all fall short. <laughs> well, you cut the rope, you fall short or stop it. I mean, what, what is that? So because you were born messed up, now Christ came, gave you a new life. In a new life, you're still trying to clean the mess. It's probably because you don't have the new life. Because the new life in Christ Jesus transformed our way of thinking, as Paul says, the renewing of the mind, that is, the renewing or changing the way we think. You will not think the same way anymore. If you are still thinking the same way, your minds have not been renewed. You do not have the Spirit of God. 
I'm sorry, the scripture clearly teaches when the spirit comes in, no strong man in a house is stronger than the spirit of God. When he comes in, he's now the strong man and no one can kick him out. Why? Because once he comes in, he seals us until the day of redemption. Now, that sealing means he's in us. So if he's in us, his fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, will naturally be produced. It may take for some 20 years. It may take for some 20 hours. But he will produce fruit if he's in you. What is that? Kindness. What is that? Patience. What is that? Temperance. What is that? Love. So if you are unloving, if you are not forgiving people, if you are holding things in your heart, I, you need to ask yourself, Holy Spirit, are you there? If you're getting mad at folk all the time, you need to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, are you there? If you're, un, if you're impatient with people all the time and nothing changing, you need to ask the Holy Spirit, Spirit, are you there? If you are not willing to suffer long for the sake of Christ, you need to ask Holy Spirit, are you there? Because the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he naturally does these things in the life of the believer. This is how we know one to be a believer. Because at times before someone did something, I may want to slap them, right? I, that's the sinful part of me, right? But now the Holy Spirit says, man, pray for them. At times before someone cut me off, I might want to blow my horn and show them some sign languages, right? But the Holy Spirit has redeemed me. And so now, in my mind, okay, that person is in a hurry. Lord, protect them. Let them get where they're going safely. And may you use them when they get there. Why? Because the Spirit of God does that. The natural man will blow the horn until the horn doesn't work anymore. But the Spirit of God transforms our thinking. Now, this is what Isaiah was prophesying about. When Messiah comes, he will do away with something. So the purpose of the coming of Messiah, watch this now, this is why the Magi's coming is so important because they came to worship a king and they brought him things that we still trying to wrestle with. Those three gifts, that's why they say there were three wise men. It wasn't three wise men. Nobody know how many they were. <laughs> All we know is that they travel in a big band of people and it's, people say three wise men because they, they had three gifts. But there is no number of the wise. We have no idea how many magi there were, right? So when the magi came to worship, they came to worship a Messiah who would die, set up a kingdom, yet live. They didn't even understand. Now these were Arabs who just came from the Middle East seeking this Jewish Messiah. And when they found the baby, guess what they did? They dropped their religion, they bowed down and they worshiped him. Whoa. This is how we know that there is only one way. When anyone comes to Jesus, I don't care what religion you come from, you drop that thing and you then worship Jesus because there is no other one to worship. We see here when Messiah came according to Daniel 9, 26, he will be cut off. And the end of the 70 weeks, at the end of the 70 weeks, uh, God will finish his transgression of Israel. The verb finish uh, Kala means to bring something to an end. So Israel's sin of disobedience will be brought to an end at Christ's second coming when she repents and turns to him as her Messiah and Savior. Then she will be restored to the land. This is why Paul says all Israel will be saved. He's not speaking of every single person in Israel. He's speaking the nation as a whole when Messiah comes because of the 144,000 witnesses in Revelation chapter 7 when they proclaim the truth individuals then will come to Christ at that point when Israel believe all Israel will be saved. That is all those who believe in Yeshua as Hamashiach, Christ as Messiah. They will come in. So this is what Daniel is speaking of God's fulfilling his promises that he made to Abram specifically of his literal biological descendants. He has a work to do with them, but he also has Abram's spiritual descendants who is the church. But Isaiah and Daniel do not have the church in mind in this context. He's literally speaking of the nation. This is why he goes back to the temple. He goes back to their sin and their sins being forgiven because they were a disobedient people to God throughout their history. 
Now, here's the thing. The day of atonement that we see in Leviticus chapter 16, uh, Messiah coming is to fulfill this whole idea of atonement. And so we see the nation of Israel, they would assemble before God for their sins, and they would go before the priest and offer a blood sacrifice to cover their sin. Though the sacrifice covered Israel's sin for 12 months, it did not permanently cover their sins. So year after year, they had to go on a day of attunement and offer blood sacrifices. This is very important because this is why the baby came. The baby came, the child was wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The little boy who the Magi came to worship, he came to be an unblemished lamb to sacrifice himself for the sin of humanity. This is the purpose of us seeing the light coming into the world. This is the purpose of the gift that has been given. This is the purpose of the first advent of Messiah to come that he would put an end to sin. So it was necessary that sacrifices be offered. This is for the nation of Israel by, um, to God, but it would not primarily remove their sins. So something must happen that would permanently remove the sin of the people. So this sacrifice was offered when Jesus came. He offered a sacrifice by him. When he offered this sacrifice, he made a payment through his death for the sins that has now been removed from the nation once they place their faith and trust in him. So his attuning work on the cross has made it possible for his future finishing of Israel's transgression. So when Christ came, he came, two things. One, to remove the transgression of Israel by dying for them that they would then place their faith and trust in him and come into his glorious kingdom. And then by grafting in those who would then believe and have the faith that Israel was supposed to have in the first place. So in other words, he came into the world to redeem the world. So God will put an end to sin, the verb, Hatam has the idea of sealing up. Here the thought is sealing something up with a view of punishment. So when Daniel is speaking, Daniel is telling him, wait a minute, uh, this will literally happen. This is going to take place. So this emphasized that Israel's sin, which had gone unpunished, would be punished. Now, of course, we see how Israel was taken into captivity over and over again and, uh, for their disobedience. Through Jesus Christ, he will be a substitute for Israel, meaning he would stand in their place so that he would bear the sins of Israel on the cross. Then, at Christ's second coming, he will remove Israel's sin permanently. This is where it says he will give them a new heart, and he will place his word upon their heart. He will remove the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And they would have no need anymore for a teacher because his word will be indwelling them. And so God made these promises to Israel. And he's going to fulfill these promises to Israel. And praise be to God that when Christ came, they rejected him because then he opened it up to a sheep that they didn't know of. And we are the sheep of Jesus Christ that Israel didn't know of. But God, even yet, he's still working with Israel. He's now working with the world, but still working with Israel in a unique way to fulfill all the promises he made to Abraham and David. And now he's grafting us in because he also made promises to humanity through Abraham and David. And this is what we've seen in the first advent where Messiah came. The purpose of the first advent we saw in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Jesus says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Jesus, when he came, he was telling his disciples, this is why I came. The purpose for me coming to this earth was to be rejected by the leaders so that they may kill me that I may die for you. Of course, he made it clear that no one took his life. He gave it up. And he gave up his life that we would have life. So the gift that was given when Christ came, and this is why when we see culturally how um, Satan has so 
malign the concept of the first advent of Christ, Christmas, to have people focusing on uh, trinkets and things that have no eternal value at all, and Christ is really not a part of the day. This is why he has Christians to remove themselves from the whole idea of Advent, to focus on things that concerns them. Because when we make Advent about us, we miss Christ. When we make the thing that God has given us to demonstrate his promises that was made to Abraham and David has come true, that is, Messiah was born, the prince, the eternal king, when we focus his arrival on us, we have just fallen into Satan's trap. He was trying to stop the baby from coming. This is why with Moses, he didn't want the people to be delivered because he knew if the people were delivered, what was going to happen. So he tried to stop Moses from being born, kill those babies. He knew Messiah was here because of Magi, and he's like, you know what? I can't allow this king to happen. Again, I'm talking about Satan. So you know what? He told Herod, kill those babies. And we know that Messiah is coming back, but we also know that two prophets will be coming back to prophesy the coming of Messiah. This is why Satan is running rampant and telling people, kill those babies. Jesus, when he came, he pronounced, he, let ev he, he, he allowed everyone to know his purpose for coming was to die. And remember what Peter said. Cephas said, Lord, that's not going to happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He rebuked Peter for telling him he, he's not going to the cross. We see also in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and will be killed and after three days rise, he'll be risen again. In Luke chapter 24, verse 26, Jesus says, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? In verse 46 he says, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and raise again and rise again from the dead on the third day. Jesus said, my purpose for coming was to suffer. My purpose for coming was to die. My purpose for coming was to be resurrected, that you would have life. The gift that Christ gave and the gift that came was not at Christ's birth, but at Christ's death. Without the death of Christ, there is no gift of Christ. There is no eternal life. Without the resurrection of Christ, there is no eternal life. Christ came not to be celebrated at birth, but to be celebrated at death. As a matter of fact, he made it so clear that he took what the whole nation was celebrating at the time of his death. He specifically intentionally died during Passover on the first day before unleavened. Why would he do that? Exodus chapter 12 in order for him to fulfill what was said, he demonstrated to them that the Passover lamb was him. So when they had the lamb on the table and they were eating it, he says, now, this is my flesh. This is why he took the bread, the unleavened bread, and said, this is my body. He was pointing back and showing how Israel was delivered from the angel of death, so too, Everyone who believe and partake of this meal will be delivered from death. And he was fulfilling that which was said to Abraham, that the whole world will be blessed through him. So when Messiah came, even the idea of Passover, Jesus says, watch this. Now, you want to see what we should celebrate. Watch what he says. This forever memorial, by the way, Passover was not instituted by Moses. In Exodus chapter 12, God said to Moses, and this shall be a forever memorial for me that you celebrate this time when you had to take an unblemished lamb, slaughter the lamb, take his blood, put it over the door so that death will pass over you. When Messiah came, his blood, he said, I am the door. And he took himself as the door. And he says, my blood now must be spilled. He took 
his own blood, put it over himself that we can come into the Father, but only through him. So Jesus, when he came, this advent that he came, he came that we would now be able to walk into the Father, but only through him. In Acts chapter 3, verse 18, he says, But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So uh, Peter is now preaching, and Peter is saying, Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament. He fulfilled the promises that were made. Jesus came when he died, and he, he now fulfilled this. But watch this, the teachers of the law didn't understand this. Fishermen had to help the teachers. Tax collectors had to help the teachers to understand. People of no means had to help the sophisticated folks. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. You give me someone with a GED who loves Jesus and show me a PhD who don't, and I will show you a fool and a wise man. And trust me when I tell you this, the foolishness, is bound up in the heart of letters. If you want to see a wise man, that man who says, I will do what God says, no matter what it costs me. The foolish man says, there is no God. I tell you, you give me a GED over a PhD any day, because those who run to Christ are 10 times, no, a hundred times wiser than those who don't. And we see this here in Acts chapter 26, verse 23. It says that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So when Christ came, he not only fulfilled what God said to King David, he also fulfilled what he said to Abram, that the world will be blessed through him. And this is why it is so important. This is why it kept speaking of Jesus um, being from the descendant of Abraham, from the descendant of David, and throughout his ministry, they keep calling him the son of David, descendant of Abraham, because of all the promises that he was going to fulfill. So in Isaiah uh, chapter 9, verse 6, when it says, For a child will be born to us, and a son will be given to us, the child was born, Yeshua HaMashiach. The son was given. The son was given. Where God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, he says, will not perish, but have everlasting life. We see this in Isaiah chapter 9, again, verse 1 through 7. But when you correlate this with Revelation chapter 7, you will then see the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham. The promise that God made to Abraham, I just realized something that I'm, I'm speaking fast, right? A lot of this might be flying by you. I'm saying a lot of things very quickly. Excuse me for that. Right now, my, my mind is filled with what is here. And my heart is rejoicing in what Christ has done. Yeah. And I want to make sure that you hear what I'm saying, even if you don't fully understand it. When we look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 through 7, we look at Revelation chapter 7. This is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that the world will be blessed through his seed. The coming of Messiah is going to usher in something. Remember, I spoke of the Chronicles. Before Messiah comes, it must be the announcement of his coming. The announcement of his coming is what we call the seven-year tribulation. It will be the things, these events that happens to point to coming of Messiah. It will be, in Revelation chapter 7, 144,000 Jewish men who are virgins. They now turn and they evangelize not just the nation of Israel, but the entire world world. And when you get down to verse 13 in the book of Revelation chapter 7, you see every nation, tribe, and tongue were being saved. People from every nation, tribes, and tongue were being saved. And you see them being martyred at the same time. And they're being translated into heaven. And they're now, it says, they are under the, 
their voices are crying out from the altar of God, Revelation chapter 7. But this is fulfilling what God said through Abram. Now notice what's going to happen. These Jewish men will put aside Judaism and pick up Yeshua HaMashiach. So now these Jewish men will completely forsake Judaism and they will now become evangelical preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they will then proliferate the gospel to the entire planet. And all who God has called will answer. They would come to saving faith in Christ Jesus. They will be saved. This is the blessing, the promise that was given to Abraham. We see it. And when we put the picture together, we see, whoa. So this is why he called these Jewish men to preach to the world. Why didn't he call the church? Because the church is no longer there. Church is being raptured. Of course, some don't believe there's a rapture, but that's okay. Um, the church will be raptured. And because the church is no longer here, God is now, it now goes back to this Old Testament motif. And so we see God fulfilling all the things he said. So the second advent, otherwise known as the second coming of Christ, is really a part of the first advent. As we see in the Old Testament scripture, the, both the first and the second advent are tied together as one thing taking place, even though it takes place over a period of years. So I started off speaking of the Chronicles of the eternal prince showing about his first coming and rejection. That's what we have in the gospels, how Messiah came and he died. Then the absence yet presence, that's the church age, how we are, would be living before Messiah comes back and the things we will be doing to proliferate the gospel of Messiah. And then the second coming announced when we are taking, that is the church is taken away, then the seven year announcement of the coming of Messiah is called a seven year tribulation. Then at the end of that seven year tribulation, the second coming or the end is when Messiah comes, set up his millennial kingdom, and then he will reign forever. So the first advent was a precursor to the second advent. The Old Testament typically placed both the first advent and second advent together. So in one sentence, they could be speaking of the first advent and in the same second speaking of, in the same sentence speaking of the second advent and you may look at it as one thing but it's actually two different things over a period of time happening all at one time according to the person who would be prophesying. And that's what we see here. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now we know the child was born. We know the child came. We know the child was given. But he doesn't have the government on his shoulder right now. He's not reigning as the Prince of Peace right now, or the Wonderful Counselor right now. He's not being called Mighty God right now, or Eternal Father right now. So that is yet future. So even though when the prophet spoke, some of the things the prophet spoke already happened, some of the things are yet future, all in one sentence. So we see this. Jesus encourages disciples to await his second coming. As a matter of fact, he spoke to them more about his second coming probably than anything else. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 39 and 44, he says, And they did not understand until the flood came and took them away so will the coming of the Son of Man be. He was letting them know that when he comes, it's going to happen like no one, no one will be able to tell when he's coming. For, and you may say, well, Pastor James, it's going to be seven years of tribulation, so if you're going through all that, how will no one know? Don't forget, the church is gone. The people who are on earth don't believe in the Bible. The 144,000 men who are witnessing are converting darkness to light, sinners to repentance. They are the only ones, 144,000 men at that time who are believers on the earth. Until they preach the gospel and people get saved through their ministry, no one believes this Bible. Why? Because there will be a church, a world church. And, and the false prophet will be leading that initiative. And he will dispel anything anyone says about Jesus. As a matter of fact, he will make sure that everyone believes that this government figure called Antichrist is indeed Christ. And he's going to make the worshipers or the church make an image in the likeness of that governmental ruler. 
and the, and the religion will give over worship to the government. And that's how we know Messiah is coming, not by people turning to him, but by people openly rejecting him and cursing him, even though they know that what is happening is because of him. Their hearts will be hardened against him. And unless these 144,000 men preach the gospel, and unless people hear their message, none will be saved. For this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Now again, for us as believers, the Son of Man can come right now because there's nothing that needs to happen for the rapture of the church to take place. There's nothing that needs to happen. We could be taken off right now, five minutes from now, five hours from now, five years from now. But Christ can literally come right now. And this is the beautiful thing of the first advent. The first advent tells us, be prepared for the second. That's what the first advent is all about. It's all about fulfilling the promise of this baby who will come. He came to become a man to suffer and die for the sin of humanity. This is the gift that God has given to us. This is eternal life. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 and verse 37. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah. Oh, man. So when Jesus comes back, demonic activity will be the standard. Governmental rulers will be demon-possessed. Leaders in churches, so-called churches, will be demon-possessed. Immorality will run rampantly. The idea of what it means to be man and woman will be destroyed. Man will be doing whatever is right in his own eyes. Why do I say that? Because he said as it was in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah in Genesis chapter 6, before the flood came, here's why God said in the flood. He said, and man was doing whatever his evil heart desired. That was in some man. That was all men except Noah. It never even said his sons were righteous. His sons were probably just like the other people. Because we see after the flood what happened. One of his sons was tripping already. But we know that God saved righteous Noah, not righteous Noah's wife. Not righteous Noah's sons. No, no, they weren't righteous. Only Noah was. They got grafted in on Noah's coattail. Noah was the daddy. Only because daddy was a friend of God that they were in. So at this whole time, the Bible shows us one righteous person on the planet. And everyone was doing what his evil heart desired. Jesus says, that is what you will see in the last days before I return. Tell me what you're seeing. Tell me what you're seeing. If you are not seeing evil men doing whatever their hearts desires, then your eyes must be closed. Because it's happening now. He says it just as it was in the days of Noah. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 13, the second coming of Messiah, he says, And I saw the heavens open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and, and in righteousness he judges and rages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in white linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Every time I see a horse, I get nervous. <laughs> I walked, I thought I liked horses because I liked John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. And I grew up watching John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. And so I thought horses were cool. I came to Texas. I met a horse. A horse with no name. Some of you get that. When I saw that creature, and I went up to it, they said, feed it. His mouth was bigger than my head. I'm like, what? Do you see the size of this thing? And it chewed. And when it... I'm like, 
No, 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 no. The thing was so wide, my legs couldn't even get around the thing. I'm like, no. I went to Tortola. Pastor McLean convinced me. Pastor Dames, you can get on this little horse right here. I don't know what the little thing was. It was one of those little small horses thing. One of those little small horses. I'm like, okay, I'm about as tall as this horse. I can get on this. I was nervous. I got on the thing. I'm like, I ain't never doing that again. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was a horse. It was donkey. I don't know what the thing was, but it, it was a small horsey thingy. I don't know what it was. But I do know this. When I come back, I'm going to be a white horse. <laughs> I don't know if the horse named Silver or what. See, I'm going back to the 80s, Tonto. I don't know if the horse has a name or if the horse has no name. But I know people say you can't wear white because your white get dirty. But when Messiah comes, those who come back with him, his bride, we will be wearing white on white horses. Now, I've never really ridden a horse before, but I assume that when I get to heaven, I don't even need to take horse classes. I am assuming that the horse is retrofitted like a Bentley, just for me. And when I get on that horse, I'm gonna look like Clint Eastwood. All I'm saying is you have a horse, and you have a white suit, and if you've never ridden a horse before, it's okay because yours is going to be coming down without wings. Messiah has promised us things that we cannot understand. His first coming and his second coming is wrapped up into one. If we proclaim the first coming without at the same time preaching the second coming, we've missed the whole thing. The reason why I hone in on Christmas and the Advent is not because I don't like Christmas. I love the Christmas season, everything about the idea of giving, of celebrating Messiah. It's just that, just like the nation of Israel, we've commingled the things of the other nations, which is the culture around us, into the things of the church in such a way that is now idolatry. And we can't even see it. I had, after a message, someone put on the Facebook post, they're probably watching, I hope you are. They said, well, I don't agree with you talking about trees and gifts. I'm a Christian and I celebrate Jesus and I got my trees and my gifts. And I don't think nothing is wrong with it. We make ourselves the standard. I'm not preaching because I believe I'm right and someone is wrong. I'm preaching what the Bible says. And, I, and, and we can call ourselves whatever we want to call ourselves, but the thing is, I'm simply telling us, when we see Advent, we should line up our celebration with what the scripture shows us. We should celebrate Messiah. We should make it about Messiah. Yes, we've been doing things for so long a certain way. Yes, we've gotten accustomed to our traditions and our practices. Yes, all I'm saying is when Messiah comes, all that will be irrelevant. We have such a great opportunity. Think about this. People who don't know him say that they're worshiping him during this time called Christmas because they don't even know what it is. But rather than the church using it as an evangelistic opportunity, we fall in the commercialization trap. And we make it about things that have nothing to do with the scripture. I'm telling you this. The first advent was the ushering in of the prince, the son of God, 
The second advent and the first advent is but one thing in the eyes of God. Messiah came, Messiah died, Messiah is coming back. This is the beauty that we have. We have the truth of God, even though the world is in a perpetual lie. If we don't tell them the truth, who will? We have such an awesome opportunity, but we focus on self and our traditions and our customs and our practices. But I say this, what about God? What about focusing on his tradition, his desires, what he wants for us to practice? I know this for sure. The first advent was mentioned and the second advent was mentioned all at the same time because the first is irrelevant without the second. And they're all one thing. A baby who would be God incarnate, growing as a lamb who's a part of a family. And this lamb that's a part of a family, the family will then have to take it and sacrifice it on a day of atonement. And the baby, he knew he would have to grow to be sacrificed on the day of atonement. And on the day of atonement, on the day of Passover, he says, now I'm giving of myself. This is the advent of Messiah, to give his life for us. And he said, everyone who looks up to the cross, everyone who places their faith and trust in him, everyone who believes that he is indeed the Son of God, that he came and he gave his life for the many. No one took it, he gave it. That he was died, he, he died, but before he died, he was rejected by his own people. He was beaten, he was scourged, he was made to be nothing. He was despised and rejected. Jesus. Nailed to a cross. And as he's on the cross, his words, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Bread his last breath. He went down to Hades and he preached. And then he came up and he destroyed the sting of death. And he had to go back to his disciples because they ran away. And he found them back at work. And he called one of them Cephas. Will you not feed my sheep? Cephas, will you not feed my sheep? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? I think he's saying the same thing to us. Will we not feed his sheep? Do we not love him? If we love him, why isn't he the priority in everything that we do? Above every tradition, above every practice, above every thought, he should reign. He is coming again. We must be prepared for that. Our Father and our God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for the wonderful works of your hands in our lives. We thank you for all that you have done and all that you are continuously doing, oh God. And I know this was a, a, a lengthy message and a lot was packed into this time. But your spirit, your spirit, oh God, your spirit guides. He leads. He encourages. He counsels. Father, I pray right now that you allow your Holy Spirit to impact our hearts and our minds, that you would draw us close to you, O oh God. Help us to draw near by the power of your Spirit, O oh God. Let this coming year be one where you have preeminence in all that we say 
and in all that we do. Father, we love you. If there is anyone this day, oh God, you know every heart, you know every mind. They may be watching this program. They may be watching it hours or days from now. They may be sitting right in this room. They have been struggling in their minds with faith. They have been struggling with all the things that they have been hearing in the culture, in their family, and they are wrestling with, is this true? Father, I pray that you convict hearts and minds right now. Only you can do it. By the power of your spirit, accomplish your will. Draw us closer to you. And if there is anyone this day who does not know you in the pardon of their sins, may you bring them into your kingdom. By the power of your spirit, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.